Jason Cut, Dr. Jason Cutton, who's a, a colleague uh, of ours at, um, at uh, Macquarie and various other places. Uh, he's going to give us a very, very comprehensive talk, I know, on uh, how we sort out the echo side of things. Thanks, Dr. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you to Michael and Sharon for inviting me to speak here. Um, so we're going to be talking about a 3D echocardiography and its special relevance to mitral valve disease. Um, so it's because we don't have in front of the screen. But I think Michael showed you the valve guidelines, and it really is a paradigm shift because for the first time, we are now, according to the 2014 valve guidelines, referring patients with severe mitral regurgitation and without evidence of associated significant other structural heart disease, without left atrial dilatation, without pulmonary hypertension, without atrial fibrillation, these people, there's a class 2C recommendation to refer them to for mitral valve surgery, especially when repair is possible. And I see three, 3D echo, and especially transesophageal echocardiography is the key to help these people get the best operation possible and also the best surgeons do the operation. It also allows a really clear representation of what we're talking about. And I know a comment from some of the surgeons that we worked with is before the advent of 3D, you know, the surgeons used to get, you know, severe mitral regurgitation, and when they opened up the patient, they didn't know what they were dealing with. So for the first time with 3D echocardiography, we can actually present the surgeons with almost exactly what they're going to be seeing when they open up the, uh, the surgeon's view, with, uh, open up the surgeon's view. And often the surgeons say, listen, enough of you talking, Jason, just show me the pictures. Um, so that's what the great advantage of 3D. Um, and just to circle here, you know, class 2A, Michael showed you these before, but class 2A recommendations for mitral valve repair, if you can do 95% chance uh, of repair and expected mortality is less than 1%. Um, and I don't think that every surgical center in Australia can do this yet, but certainly this is why as Michael mentioned, we should be creating you know, reference centers like they do in the United States where people can send their difficult mitral valve surgeries to. Um, I just wanted to get a quick idea about where people were with 3D, 3D echo. Um, so who doesn't have the gear and therefore has got no experience? So, so a few of you. Um, I'm sure the people outside would love to hear from you. Um, who's, who's got the gear, who's got the 3D but doesn't see the point, hasn't found it useful in clinical practice? So not many of you. Who's tried it but hasn't found it helpful? So a few of you. Um, who's used, increasing their use of 3D in their day-to-day -day workflow? So most of you. Um, and who uses it all the time, day-to-day? -day? So there's a few of you as well. I like to think of 3D, you know, 3D echo as a door to a room which you can enter and you can basically study that room in any, in any particular viewpoint. As you start to get familiar with the technology and the limitations of the technology, you can, you can really start to get some really good pictures and you start to have a real understanding of cardiac anatomy. And certainly my experience, knowledge of cardiac anatomy has increased significantly since I started using 3D. Um, so coming back to the Carpentier triad, um, we can actually get an understanding of disease etiology, we get an understanding of what the lesion is, and we get an understanding of the level of dysfunction. And I know there's quite a few sonographers in the room, and you know, when I'm training our sonographers when I practice in Macquarie University Hospital, I think the first step for them is to, to talk about, yes, there's severe mitral regurgitation. But I, my sonographers, a few of them are here today, I'll always emphasize to them what is the mechanism of the dysfunction, and then I want you to tell me a little bit about the pathology. And, you know, we've sent some of our sonographers to theatres, cardiac theatres in Macquarie University Hospital. They've watched Michael Vololi and Michael Wilson operate. And really, if you're a sonographer, you know, I think it's essential that you actually get a chance to see what the real-life pathology is looking like. And if you haven't had a chance to go to theatre, you know, at the institution, please try, try and go there. So then you actually see what you're taking pictures of, of every day. Um, valves are 3D structures, and really when you get an idea of what they look like in 3D, you can better understand them in 2D. Um, so when, when I think about looking at things in 3D, I just think about, do I want to be looking at the pictures in A, or do I want to be looking at really pretty pictures like uh, B? And this is how I think about uh, either 2D echo or something like 3D echo. All right? You can sort of see how pretty, the, you know, this is the one on the... Uh, the one on this side is a really pretty full volume reconstructed uh, image of a Barlow's type mitral valve, and that's a plain old 2D echo. 
Um, so what we aim to provide in 3D, in 3D TOE is a surgical view. So when the, when the surgeon opens up the left atrium, we try to, try to provide an exact approximation of what the surgeon sees at the, at the time of surgery. Um, and this is a better clear representation of it with the anterior leaflet at the top um, and the, the leaflets arranged A, A2, uh, A1, A2, P3 and the posterior leaflet down the bottom with the aortic valve up the top. And that's the view I'll try and get on transesophageal echocardiography. You always got to think the, uh, the left atrial appendage on the left, the aortic valve on top. Once, when, when you think about those things, you can get the view every time. There are currently guidelines published by the American Society of Echocardiography, also the European societies, about standardizing views. Because now we actually, actually take the pictures, we have to have a standardized way of presenting the views to each other. And for the mitral valve, for the aortic valve, for the, other, for the other valves, these provide guidelines and these are easily downloadable and found on the internet. Um, this is an example um, of a typical 3D picture that I might um, have where you see the uh, aortic valve up the top, left atrial appendage, and then the mitral valve. And this is Lavalo's uh, type with prolapse of, of A2 and A2 and P2, large, large annulus um, and commissures. Um, so the typical view we'll try and get to present, to, present um, to have a look at the valve prior to surgery. So the advantages of, of 3D transesophageal echo include very precise lesion localization. And I think I'll show you a study that even better than, than, regular, than regular 2D. It also very clearly shows us the mechanisms causing mitral regurgitation. We can also start to improve the quantification of mitral regurgitation. Now some of these techniques are a little bit time consuming um, and it's take offline, but I think it's very important that they will be used, used in the future. It also allows to best talk about the surgical approach and I'm sure the surgeons will be talking a bit about that later. And also, if we've got a very complex valve and if the echo looks very complex, we can, it helps us choose the surgeon who's going to be doing this because I know Michael Valeli mentioned that you know, a lot of surgeons are doing a lot of things, but really for very complex surgery, there should really only be a few people doing the really complex stuff and referring it with an organization to the best person um, to doing it. And also post-operatively 3D is great for looking at par paravalvular leaks, any complications regarding mitral valve surgery. So 3D is much is more accurate. There have been studies to show that 3D is better than 2D at working out the localization of flail leaflets and of the number of prolapsing segments. 2D it's possible to miss prolapsing segments. While when you and when you send that patient for surgery, you want to get a good best idea of how many segments are involved. The greater the amount of prolapsing segments involved, the greater the complexity of the surgery. Um, the other really great advantage of 3D that um, 2D can miss is the difference between an indentation and a cleft. So an indentation is where you have a groove less than 50% of the leaflet, and a cleft is where you have a groove greater than 50% of the leaflet. Um, and this is an example of a 3D showing a mitral valve cleft. Um, see over there, that was causing significant uh, mitral regurgitation in a young woman with Down syndrome. The other thing we're starting to do is something called parametric maps. Um, so what we do with the parametric maps is offline, once we've taken all, taken all the images, we start to create maps of what the mitral valve annulus looks like and also what the leaflets, also what the leaflets are looking like. The great thing about parametric maps is it points an easy way to communicate to each other. The red part is the part going into the left atrium. It gives us a very good idea about um, left atrial size. Uh, so not so that just shows that mitral annular size. The problem is doing these maps are consuming. Currently, and since I've been using 3D since 2012, we're now in 2015, the technology has not advanced all that much. It still takes about at least half an hour offline afterwards to be creating one of these maps. And I have the help of a great team of sonographers at my practice, Sydney Cardiology. Um, so three years on, we're still not much better with the post-processing software. Um, it's given us a great idea about the shape of the mitral annulus, and as with different disease states, the shape of the mitral annulus changes. In functional mitral valve disease, the annulus certainly looks very different to degenerative mitral valve disease. But we get very good idea when we, as we get better at them, we get a very good idea about which of the prolapsing segments 
um, in relation to the commerce euros as well. So here's a sort of more typical Barlow's type valve where multiple segments are prolapsing, where here would be sort of a, a typical uh, single, single, single segment prolapse. And these are very easily communicable to our colleagues as well. Um, so degenerative mitral valve disease is a spectrum. Um, we start off with fibroelastic deficiency. As we start to get more tissue in the valve and thinning out of the valve, we move across to a Barlow's type valve. I think it's really important to realize that this is not just, as you know, not just one pathology. And these look, these have different appearances on 3D echocardiography. And I'm going to show you some examples of, uh, examples of all of these. And I think when you're thinking about not just the, not just the mechan mechanism, but think about what pathology we're dealing with. 3D also is a great educational tool. And when you think about 3D, you know, what I like to do is take it when I'm doing the transesophageal echo, is take a nice 3D picture at the start to see what I'm dealing with. And then I'll come back and do my full 2D transesophageal exam and then come back to take the, the pretty 3D pictures. Basically allows us to get an idea about where we're sitting with our typical transesophageal echo with the sort of various chamber, chamber views as well. Um, these are some examples of what things might look like. So on the surgeon's, so on the surgeon's view, um, the four-chamber view cutting across the valve, where we're going to get some A2 and A2 and P1. Um, next view is a two, typical 2D commissurial view, um, and it's a typical view where you'd see P2 crawling up, P2 prolapsing upwards um, in the commissurial view, and this is a, a long-axis view where you typically see A2 and P2 um, with the, the color jet going away from the segment of the prolapse. So as an echocardiographer, my goals of, of imaging prior to mitral valve surgery, and essentially the surgeon does not get a surprise when they're, you know, and or when they're having the preoperative toe at the time of the, uh, the time of anesthesia. And as you all know, and especially I think for the for sonographers, when people go and bypass when they're having anesthesia, mitral regurgitation, things can look things can look very different. So I try to classify the mechanism of mitral regurgitation. I'll have an assessment of LV function and size. And as we're getting better with 3D, we can actually start to do that. 3D, vol 3D volumes and measurements are possible as well. Um, and we're starting to do that with 3D echocardiography. They're proving much more accurate than Simpson's biplane method or Tycho to any other measurement we might be doing. Um, we also try to talk about the severity of the mitral regurgitation um, and whether there's a presence of valve calcification. And Michael Verley showed you that case before where there was extensive valve calcification, which made the operation much more difficult. And I think this is really important to comment on on your preoperative transesophageal echo. Um, we also get an idea of the annulus, especially when we start to do those parametric maps, we can very, me we can very accurately measure, measure the annulus. We also do it in a couple of views. And don't forget the tricuspid, don't forget measuring the tricuspid valve as well. We can also get an idea of cord or length. So in 2005, when I have a patient coming for mitral valve surgery, there are three options. And the surgeons at our institutions um, can operate in three different ways. They can, they can do an open stenotomy, um, which is the older style. Um, you can do a minimally invasive approach from a right thoracotomy. And I had a patient in my rooms the other day who had a scar about that big after mitral valve surgery um, in, you know, in on the, just between the ribs, or we can, it's possible to do it robotically as well with a, with a Da Vinci robot. Um, and good echo becomes vital in helping decide which patient's gonna have which of those approaches. Um, you know, not all surgeries for every pathology. Um, and also, I think it's really important that repair is expected, especially when we're sending asymptomatic people. And we've got to try and offer our patients the best possible best possible results. And you know, I've, I've, I was at the Mayo Clinic um, last in 2013. I spent a week there, quite a few days in their operating theatres with Rakesh Suri and the team there. They do two robotic mitral valve surgeries a day. Right, so in weekly surgery, they do they do eight probably eight mitral valve surgeries a week um, robotically. I don't think there's any, so I know it's the Mayo Center, Mayo Clinic, but when we think about those are the sort of volumes that a reference mitral valve, mitral valve center is doing. And I don't think there are many places in Australia that are doing some, something similar, nor are they getting those sort of numbers. So our approach at Macquarie University Hospital is this. 
all patients that put up for, for mitral valve surgery with degenerative mitral valve disease get a, pre, a preoperative transesophageal echo that is usually done a few weeks before the surgery. Um, we create a worksheet, which I'll show you. We try to create 3D maps and we do some measurements. Um, we have a discussion between the clinician, the echocardiographer, and the surgeon and the heart team. And often I'll line up a few, we'll line up an afternoon of mitral valve disease and then the surgeons will come and speak afterwards and look at all the images offline. Um, I only have experience with a Philips IE33 at the moment, X72T probe, and we're using MVQ software. Um, these are the sort of maps and reports that we, that we try to generate. We create a mitral valve anatomy report for most of the patients. It, when you get to use some of these measurements, we get an idea of the annular size, we get an idea of leaflet area, we get an idea of leaflet volume, we can get an idea of leaflet length, um, and then the auto, the auto mitral, mitral angle becomes important when thinking about the risk of postoperative systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. Michael Vallely and Michael Wilson brought this worksheet back to me. It's from Chitwood, who's at the East Carolina Heart Center, and um, this is a worksheet we try for them for most patients as well, where we get all these measurements. None of these measurements are standard, unnecessarily standard measurements. Very difficult to find, you know, you know, online about how to exactly take them, but we're trying to do the, the we come up with a standardized set of where we where we take them from, and we try to put put both of these together. Um, certainly a lot of the measurements we can get from the mitral valve anatomy report. So I want to tell you some of the lessons that I've learned in three years of doing um, three years of doing 3D, 3D echo. Um, we know it's not just one disease, um, and the, each pathology needs a different approach. I find it much better having an anaesthetist present when I'm doing my toe. Does anyone, are there any cardiologists there have an anaesthetist present when doing their transesophageal echo? Um, you can see the, the benefit of, of having it done. Certainly with 3D, you avoid, you know, you avoid a distressed patient. Um, we're allowed to, you know, you don't have to worry about breath holding. We often have a very stable heart rate. And I really think that I get the best pictures that way. And really, that's the name of the game when doing 3D echo. You really want to produce the best pictures. Having, having a, not a great study is, is not a diagnostic study. Um, I generally have got, got the luxury of having sonographers with me as well who can do a lot of the buttonology and the knobology. And still, it's getting better, but it's still got a bit of a, a bit of a way to go. And so they help me optimize the images when I'm focusing on taking the pictures. Um, atrial, by the time they're in atrial fibrillation, it's not a good time to do. Unstable heart rates make stitching full volume pictures a little bit a little bit difficult. Um, and you need a very good 2D picture first. Um, 3D often is a balance between sector size, frame rate, and image resolution, and we have to often come up with a come up with a compromise, um, and we compromise between these th between temporal resolution, spatial resolution, and uh, and size in order to get the best pictures. And in, in a way, that needs to be individualized for every patient. There's no standard settings that I can tell that we can sort of people can give you. You have to play around with the buttons until you get the best pictures for the patient you have in front of them. So I'm going to now show you something about the 3D echo modes. For those of you who might not have seen a lot of 3D, we can do real time. So we use live 3D, 3D color, and 3D zoom. These are just press the button and go in real time. We can use multi-beat. So we use full volumes or full volume color. And then the other that I'll show you I think is really useful is biplane imaging as well. So when you use on the Philips X72T probe, we have this thing called um, X-plane. We use multi-plane at orthogonal angles to each other. The advantage is it's excellent frame rate. We can use Doppler and we use lots of scanning planes. So this is someone with a uh, young man with mitral valve prolapse. Um, and what we do is we get a commissurial view. I take the X-plane and look at an orthogonal plane. And you can see the prolapse and segments on the image on the right in the long axis. I then scan using the X-plane. Um, looking at all the segments of the mitral valve, looking, seeing which segment is prolapsing, so I don't miss a, don't miss a prolapsing segment beforehand. Um, you can see they're going through P1, and there is on the long axis, there is some, a small amount of prolapse of um, P1 as well. Um, so I think that is a very nice technique if you've got that on, on your machine. Um, make sure you don't miss any segments that are prolapsing. The real-time 3D narrow volume, so this is where you just click real-time 3D on the machine. It gives you a good frame rate, 
it's not good for actually taking you know, detailed pictures of the mitral valve, but it's best for guiding procedures in the lab, um, and it's fairly easy, um, but it gives you a fairly small fixed volume. And this is what it might look like. So this is when you just turn on the live 3D. Um, you can see that in this picture, we do have a prolapsing mitral valve, um, but it's not great, it's not fantastic for giving you detail. Uh, and this is when you just turn on 3D, 3D color. Um, I was speaking with one of the cardiologists this morning, there's a lot of 3D as well. 3D color is a great promise of this technology, but we're still having, this still takes a bit of time to create these 3D color maps, uh, 3, 3D color, um, and takes a lot of time offline to, to process them properly. Um, Real-time 3D zoom is what I present. Uh, mostly this is the most useful when looking at anatomy. It's best for valve morphology. It's got great spatial resolution, okay temporal resolution. It allows rapid and confident recognition of valve lesions and pathology. Also for clefts, commissures, leaflet perforation. So this is an example of what it might look like. It's bileaflet, uh, bileaflet mitral, uh, mitral valve prolapse. Um, with the left atrial appendage on the left, aorta at the top. And really allows us to see very nicely the size of the leaflet. And I, something I only learned sort of, you know, afterwards, you know, when you, 3D allows a very close examination of anatomy. Um, you can very get very good ideas about the shapes of the anterior leaflet, the shape of the posterior leaflet, where the indentations are, how it compares to, to, how it compares to the annulus, and also allows us very well to see the commissures as well. And it's important to examine the commissures in case you miss commissure rejects. Full volume gives us the largest sector possible. Um, often to create a full volume image, you need good ECG gating because we stitch together multiple images that we put together. Um, it allows good spatial and temporal resolution. The downside is sometimes you get stitching art artifacts. Um, and essentially, just to think about it schematically, multiple beats of ECG to, cre to create the image. So we try to use uh, four beats together, ideally, um, to create a really nice picture. Um, and this is what a full volume image might, might look like. And when you take a full volume image, that allows you to go and post-process it offline using the software, and then do whatever, manipulate in any plane that you like. This is, it projects okay, but very nice full volume seeing a prolapse of a P, of a P3 segment with ruptured, with ruptured cords as well. And that's when we can really get all the data together in, in the best possible way. Another example of a sort of, a, you know, a Barlow's type valve with very enlarged leaflet, leaflet area. Um, once we have the full volume, we can then take it and quantify it on, on, this, on the MVQ software. Um, so we talked about how echocardiography differentiates degenerative mitral valve disease and how close it approximates what you see at surgery. So when you talk about disease, fibroelastic deficiency, um, it's an example of a P2, uh, a fibroelastic deficiency, P2 prolapse, um, it's what the 2D toe might look you. We showed you a still before with the, with the regurgitation going away from the prolapse. And this is what it might look like on 3D with the prolapsing segment coming out towards you here. And you can see the ruptured, ruptured cordy as well coming out towards you in the distance. Um, and that's the generally isolated lesion. This is an image that you can see the cropping lines here. So what I've done with this particular image is I've then take it, taken it to the MVQ software, I've made it look fairly pretty, I've taken away all the noise, and I've created a very nice, a very nice picture of that same P2, uh, that same T P2 prolapse. Um, it's another example of fibroelastic deficiency and uh, more of a P, uh, P2, P1 segment there. Barlow's prolapse, very different pathology. You see the valve looks very different to the last one on 3D, you know, billowing, you know, prolapsing valve leaflets, um, much more leaflet tissue. And this is a very nice uh, case of a young 40, sort of a 45 year old man. You can see this very large segment of the posterior, of the posterior leaflet coming up towards us in the surgical view. 
of the glossy system prolapse of the anterior anterior leaflet as well. Um, we also can start to, to measure leaflet heights. Now, this is about another example of a Barlow's valve involving all of the posterior, involving the posterior leaflet of one kid. And on this particular view, you can actually see, get, this is a slightly not, not surgical view with aorta down the bottom, but allows us to actually see the height of the, of the prolapsing posterior leaflet. The greater the height of the posterior leaflet, we know often the more difficult the surgical repair will be. Um, and um, this just shows you that sometimes it's nice to take some slightly off-surgical off off surgical views of the mitral valve. Um, Vegas, uh, who's written a book about uh, perioperative 3D transesophageal echocardiography, has suggested these views. The standard view, the anterolateral commissurial view, the posterior medial commissurial view, and looking at the scallops as well. <laughs> um, this is a series of echoes to show you. It's very easy to see where the, where the defect is. Um, and then we can use 3D, 3D color as well to help us identify the, le the, the exact location of the mitral regurgitus and jet. It works better when you can actually t t take it offline, I think. Um, the advantages of 3D echo as well will allow us to start to quantify mitral regurgitation. There have been studies to show that you can actually do a 3D vena contractor, 3D vena contractor, calculate an, an ERO as well, and these will start to happen as the software gets better and less time consuming. Um, sometimes there are specific questions we have in disease. Which scallop is affected? We can use the surgeon's view or, the, or MPR offline. Are the commissures involved, which are important, as I mentioned? Are the calcifications? 2D is better. Even X-ray and CT are important for looking at that. Mitral valve apparatus, um, and in terms of tissue as well. So 3D can help answer all these questions that do become important. It also gives us an idea about what the risk of systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve is postoperatively. On those worksheets that I showed you, we're starting to measure the aorta mitral angle. We're measuring the C-sept distance between the septum and the anterior mitral valve leaflet. We're measuring the size of the leaflets as well. We look at the coaptation line, as mentioned before, the posterior mitral valve leaflet height. Also, people with very small ventricles and a basal septal bulge found, are found to get higher risk of SAM as well, post-mitral valve surgery. Um, and these are some of the things that predict for uh, poor outcome after mitral valve repair. Um, you know, for a simple P2 prolapse, people do get very good long-term results as the complexity of the mitral valve surgery increases when you get Barlow's type valve or, or bileaflet prolapse, you start to get higher recurrent mitral regurgitation and reoperation rates. And I know one of the most, a couple of the most sinking feelings I've had as a cardiologist is where you end up sending someone for a mitral valve, mitral valve repair, and they end up, as Michael Bird said, they end up with a metal valve and a warfarin. And I think that is not a great outcome for a patient. Um, and never always, uh, it's difficult as a cardiologist when that patient comes and sees you and follow up. So as a group of cardi cardiologists, as a community, we need to be thinking about, you know, we need to send the patient to the best the pathology, for, to the best surgeon, to the best operation for them. Um, so conclusions about severe degenerative mitral regurgitation. We have an integrated assessment of severity and etiology. Um, we think about timing of surgery. You know, early surgery these days is preferable, provided that you can do mitral valve repair. I think decision-making needs to be collaborative and in a heart team, um, and we certainly do that at Macquarie University Hospital, where we sit down with the surgeons on a regular basis and we'll go through the cases as well. Um, and, you know, our goal is um, successful mitral valve repair with a uh, long-term long outcome. So thank you very much, everyone. Mm -hmm.